Not often you get to sing Christmas tunes in September. So it's Tuesday evening, I was watching TV and my program is interrupted by a special news report. The anchor man comes on the TV and tells me that at this very moment, United States Armed Forces are sending bombers into Syria and launching cruise missiles into Syria to attack the positions of ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Those people have threatened me and the people of my country. Those people have told their brothers to rise up and kill United States soldiers. They have warned me that I am not safe in my own home. But yet I sit in my spacious home in suburbia, USA, and I do not hear the sound of rockets. I do not hear bombs dropping. I do not hear this pop of Kalashnikovs in my neighborhood. But the war rages. All I hear are the, are the crickets and the frogs outside and the rustling of the branches in the cool autumn in Georgia. But the war rages. It rages in my home because I see it in my children and my spouse. The war rages in my community because I see it in my Christian friends and it rages right here in this congregation because I see it in the people whom God has called me to serve. And it's a war that has been raging since that time and in that sweet garden when my first parents and your first parents rebelled against God and God approached that wily foe, that ancient serpent, and he said, I'm going to put enmity, hostility, animosity. There will be war between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. There will be war. And it makes me tired. And it makes me weary. And I lose hope. And that's what John saw in his revelation in our lesson today. John's revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 12. People are intimidated by the book of Revelation because they say, I just don't get it. But when you have it explained to you, it's really simple. What John is seeing is a picture of the end times in which we're living now. And he sees a picture of Judgment Day. And he sees a picture of heaven. But he sees it from different camera angles. So he's seeing the same thing just from a different perspective. And the main point of the book of Revelation is very simple. It's two words. Jesus wins. That's it. Jesus wins. Why was John privileged to see these revelations of the end times and of Judgment Day and of heaven? Well, he was on an island called Patmos. It's about 50 miles southwest of the city of Ephesus. It means nothing to you. Off the coast of modern-day Turkey, okay? He's there because on mainland, the Roman authorities were imposing, enforcing this cult emperor worship. And John had been preaching that Jesus is the king, that he is God. And because of that, he was exiled to Patmos for the rest of his life. But his brothers and sisters on the mainland, they were having the sword put to their neck and saying, you confess that Caesar is God, or we'll throw you to the lions, we'll use this sword, we'll torture you, whatever it takes. But you confess that Caesar is God, not this Jesus, this Jewish rabbi. And because of that, there were some within the church who were promoting this policy of compromise. John said, don't do that. Jesus wins, and I've seen it. So stand firm. Because the battle rages, but the war is won. Here's what John saw in his revelation. 
he saw a great dragon. It's more terrifying than any Halloween costume that, that you'll see in Walmart today. It's a giant red dragon, enormous, terrifying. He has seven heads, and he has ten horns on each of those heads and a crown on each of those seven heads. And he's powerful. With his tail, he swipes a third of the stars out of the sky, and they fall to the ground. I can't do that. This dragon is powerful. This is the devil. This is Satan. This is one of the creatures that God created on the six days of creation, but rebelled against God. And God cast him out of heaven, along with all of his angels, whom we call demons. And John says this, this dragon, that ancient serpent, see he goes back to Genesis 3, called the devil or Satan, leads the whole world astray. That's his purpose, is to lead the world astray. And we see how he does that in the names that John gives him. First of all, the devil. The devil means liar. Didn't he do that with Adam and Eve in the garden? Lied to them? Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? No, you're not going to die. God doesn't want you to be as he is. And doesn't he use that same weapon as he marches into battle against God's people? God says he's going to protect you, right? No, he's not. You've seen what's happened to Christians over in Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan. What if that came here? What if that happens here in the United States? And it very well could. Does God have enough angels to protect you, to keep you safe? He hasn't kept those Christians safe. And so he spreads more lies. God really say that there's only just one way to get to heaven if there is such a thing? Just the one way? Because that's kind of closed-minded. Aren't, aren't you all just kind of going to the same place but just reaching it in a different way? Isn't that what you're doing? And God continues, or Satan continues to tell his lies. This Stuff about marriage that's been in the news. God really say it's between a man and a woman? Really? What if two people just love each other? Can't they do what they want? We want them to be happy, don't we? And the devil continues to tell his lies so that we are tempted to, to compromise on the word of God. He leads the world astray. Another name that, that John gives him is Satan. Satan is a Hebrew name that means the accuser. Another weapon that he pulls out from his arsenal. He accuses. Didn't he do that with, with Judas? Judas betrayed his, his Lord and his teacher, and he sees what, what's going to happen to Jesus, and he's filled with remorse. And what Satan does is he continues to accuse him. Look what you did, Judas. Look what you did. And he can't handle it anymore. And he comes to the point of despair that he kills himself. He takes the wrong way out. And isn't that what Satan does to you and me? He continues to point the finger because he knows God's word too. And he says, look what you did. You have compromised the word of God. You have failed to trust in God, even though he tells you to do that. And what John sees is that Satan then takes that he sends his demons first to tempt you. You fall into sin. He quick rushes before the throne of God and he says, look, look what your people do. They have sinned. What are you going to do about it? Day and night, John sees this happening in heaven. It's hard enough for our consciences to know that God sees everything about me. The things that I say the things that I do, and then those dark desires of my heart. Satan takes those before God and makes sure that he throws it in his face to say, look what he's done. I don't know about you, but I get, I get tired. I grow weak and weary in this battle that seems to rage into eternity. The battle rages. There's not much that we can do because the foe, the adversary, is, he's powerful. 
and he'll tear you to pieces. But John sees war in the sky, and he sees other angels too. I want to point that out. The translation is not the best. The context in the Greek better reflects there is war in the sky. There's war in the sky, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in the sky. The great dragon was hurled down to earth, and his angels with him. John sees Michael, the <laughs> angel that we heard about in the first lesson from prophet Daniel. Daniel saw him. He's the archangel, the, the commander of the armies of the Lord of hosts, and he leads the armies of the Lord into battle against the dragon and his armies, and he wins. Some people misinterpret this passage and say that this is when Satan originally rebelled against God and God cast him out of heaven. And they link it with Luke chapter 10 where Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. That's not what's happening here. What's happening here is uh, this battle is a representation of that time when Satan lost his ability to accuse you and me before the throne of God. We saw that battle in the wilderness as the devil is tempting Jesus to sin. We see that struggle in Gethsemane as Jesus is praying to his Father. We see that struggle on Calvary, but something that we don't see is this, Michael and the angels fighting against the dragon and his soldiers in the heavenly realms. But they win. See, what Satan tried to do was he tried to attack not only Michael and the good guys, but our commander-in-chief. And he's dragged into the wilderness, Jesus says. He goes there, and Satan tries his best to find something that he can take to God and say, look, look at what Jesus has done. But Jesus emerges from that arena victorious because there's nothing that Satan has against him. And for the rest of his ministry, Satan tries to accuse Jesus of something, but he can't do it. So he says, let's just get rid of him. And so he convinces Judas to betray him. And he convinces the religious leaders to hand him over and arrest him. He convinces the crowd to shout, crucify. And he convinces Pontius Pilate to take the easy way out. But little did he know that he was putting the noose around his own neck. And when Jesus hung his head and died, there the world saw that foot come down on the head of the serpent, crushing it. Satan lost his power there to accuse you before the throne of God. And John saw it in his vision. He said, they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb. The lamb whose blood is pure and holy and innocent and you cannot accuse it of anything has washed you, has cleansed you of your compromise, of those times that you have failed to trust and rely on God. Washed away through your baptism. Satan cannot accuse you anymore because of the blood of the Lamb. But there's more. John said they overcame him because of the word of their testimony. You and I are, are called to testify, not to stand up in church and say, Pastor, I want to testify, not that. We are called to witness, to share this good news with other people. So when your friend who is despairing of life comes to you and you say to them, but my friend, Jesus loves you and Jesus has forgiven you. There the devil loses and he has to run away. When you sit down with your spouse or your children or your parents and you say to them, but Jesus loves you and I forgive you and he forgives you too, there Satan loses and he has to run away because of the blood of the Lamb. 
you have overcome because of Jesus. And what's interesting is that the word, the Greek word John uses for overcome is where we get our word Nike. Maybe we should change that advertising slogan from just do it to you will win. Because that's what Jesus has done for you. You will win. You have overcome. You have won the victory. The war is won, but the battle still rages. John said, Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. The dragon knows that the war is lost. And he knows that his time has not yet come to be cast into that lake of burning fire and to be locked away in the dungeons of hell forever. And so what he's going to do is try to grab as many of you as possible and drag you down to hell with him. But remember what John saw. He was not strong enough. Because God and Michael and his angels are more powerful. And God promises to deploy his troops to protect you, to serve you, to keep you safe until that day he calls you home. But what about the people who received this? John's readers who are being persecuted. Because some of them, John said, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Which means they said, no, Caesar is not God, Jesus is God. And they were thrown to the lions. What about them? Did God fail to protect them? Did he fail to deploy his angels to save them? No. Because they considered that message of the blood of the Lamb more important than their own lives because they knew that that message of the blood of the Lamb gave them life eternal. And even in their time of suffering and torture and death, God's angels were right there, and they escorted them home to heaven. So, if the sword of Isis reaches out to touch my neck, and if hatred an animosity towards you because you confess Jesus as Lord and God causes you to suffer and maybe even to die. God's angels will be present and they will escort you home to heaven. Because the battle will rage, the dragon will rage against you, but my friends take heart. The war is won. And Jesus has a crown of victory waiting for you. Amen. We now respond to our God and his word with our song, Creates in Me. Please stand. be seated.
This time I'll ask Brittany Keene to please step forward. Dear members of Mighty Fortress Lutheran Church, Brittany Keene, having been baptized and instructed in the teachings of the Word of God, desires to become a member of this congregation. Dear sister in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him here on earth. You have come before this Christian congregation to declare your faith and unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your heart to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Brittany, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the Word of God? If so, answer, I do. I do. do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, be diligent in the use of God's Word and sacraments, and lead a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Having heard your promises, we, the members of Mighty Fortress Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love and invite you to share in our worship and mission. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, in mercy you joined this sister in Christ to your church when she was born again of water and the Spirit. In mercy you taught Brittany your saving truth. Grant that she may offer herself as a living sacrifice to you as her spiritual act of worship. Transform Brittany by the renewing of her mind so that she will not conform to the pattern of this world. Help us to live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit, and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand for prayer. <clears throat> 